Hello everyone. Welcome back to the batch of excellence. So lovely to see you guys back here. So everyone, you all aware that we have been learning the course of organic chemistry in this batch of excellence, where we make sure that we learn the entire organic chemistry with respect to your Bohr's as well as JE and NEET. So in our today's class, we will be discussing about continuation of chapter called polymer. And this is Sagar Darvi, your chemistry teacher. I welcome you to this today's class. So guys, let us quickly first see what exactly are we going to learn in today's class and then we can start. So on your screen, you can see in the previous class, we discussed about the introduction of polymer. We got introduced to all the basic terms, what is called monomer, what is polymer, what is polymerization. We saw several ways by which we can classify the polymers. And then we learned some important addition polymers. Right, everyone? So today we will be discussing about the condensation polymers. So the first category of condensation polymer is basically polyamide. All the polyamide fibers, we call them as nylon. So as long as our syllabus is concerned, in this uh, nylon we talk about nylon 6, which is also called as perlon L. We'll be discussing nylon 6, 6, followed by nylon 6, 10, then nylon 2 and nylon 6. Out of which nylon 2 and nylon 6 are biodegradable polymer, whereas rest all polymers of nylons are non-biodegradable. Once that is done, we'll be talking about another important condensation polymer that is phenol formaldehyde polymers. So you'll see phenol and formaldehyde forming an important thermosetting polymer, or you can also call it as crosslink polymer that is called bakelite. Followed by we'll be talking about melamine formaldehyde polymer. So that is another class of condensation polymer we will be learning followed by we'll be discussing about polyester molecule that is sterilin also referred as decron at times and then the next class of compound biodegradable polymer so one of which we have already covered here nylon 2 nylon 6 is one of the example of biodegradable polymer itself we'll be discussing about phbv that is poly beta hydroxy valerate co beta hydroxy uh, butyrate uh, uh, small correction poly beta hydroxy butyrate co beta hydroxy valerate so butyrate should be called first and then valerate that's what phbv stand for we'll be then discussing about pga that is polyglycolic acid and polylactic acid <laughs> when these two taken together we sometimes also call as plga and then finally we'll be discussing about the molecular mass of polymer We'll certainly be seeing that why do we refer it as average molecular mass and why not the precise molecular mass. So guys, that is going to be the last part of our today's chapter that is polymer. So let's get started with the first part that is condensation polymer. Well, in general, so far in organic chemistry, we have seen that condensation is the process where we allow two or more than two compounds to react with each other. Generally, they are uh, bifunctional or maybe monofunctional as well. In this cases, we'll be talking about monofunctional as well as bifunctional compounds here. When you allow such compounds to react with each other, they give you desired product formation along with elimination of small fragments such as water or alcohol or something of that sort. Such process where two or more than two reactants react to give you a desired product with the elimination of small fragment is what we call it as condensation reaction. So guys, when such condensation reaction is used for the preparation of certain polymers, those polymer belongs to a category of condensation polymers, sometimes also called as step growth polymers. So the first category of condensation polymer are nylons. And nylons are largely known as polyamide fiber. So that clearly indicates the function of present in this polymer is going to be amide. Let us talk about nylon 6. By the way, nylon 6, sometimes also known as perlon L. So as we have been seeing that, whenever we are forming a particular polymer, it is very important for us to know what is the monomer used for the formation of that particular compound. So here, when you talk about nylon 6, nylon 6 is prepared from a monomer that is called as Epsilon caprolactam. Epsilon caprolactam. If you see the term caprolactam, lactam indicates cyclic amide. When such cyclic amide is obtained from the derivative of caproic acid, 
that is an acid containing 6 carbon atom we call it as epsilon caprolactam all right so structurally we can represent it this way uh, we'll draw a seven membered cyclic structure let's say and let's say i'm making a functional group amide that is nh okay you can see here that's the functional group amide so with respect to with respect to original caproic acid let's say this was carbonyl carbon atom of carboxylic acid so carbon which is next to carbonyl carbon is alpha this is beta gamma delta and omega so the NH2 group was present at the omega position of caproic acid. So you can say that we had omega amino caproic acid, which upon condensation have produced a cyclic amide, which we call it as lactam. So we call it as epsilon caprolactam. Now, this epsilon caprolactam is subjected to the process of hydrolysis, let's say. So, if we subject it to process of hydrolysis, let's say upon hydrolysis, hydrolysis is breakage using water H plus OH minus. So, you will see one of the functional groups developed over here would be COOH. Then CH2, 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 and CH2. How many methylene CH2 groups we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So COOH, CH2, 5 times, and NH2 is what we are going to get. That is nothing but epsilon, or you can say omega amino caproic acid. So we'll be getting NH2. I'm highlighting one of the H. That's the NH2 group we have got. Then CH2, 5 times. Further connected to functional group COOH. That is COOH. All right. And now let's say we are taking n number of this. So we had epsilon caprolactam. We hydrolyzed to give you this compound. Of course, to have n number of this, you can also say that the initial compound itself, epsilon caprolactam, were taken many a time. So that's your monomer, a primary monomeric unit. Upon hydrolysis, gave you this compound. And now this will undergo further polymerization so let us say this is subjected to further polymerization at a higher temperature generally the temperature ranges between 400 to 600 kelvin of course that varies according to what particular polymer is formed However, not really important for us to know the precise temperature. So, we are just mentioning the heat. So, upon heating now, this N molecules will undergo polymerization. As if you, as you see in this molecules, it's a bifunctional organic compound. We have got functional COOH as well as NH2. Now, this two when condenses, condenses as in, imagine, this is first molecule. Now, since we have taken N, let's assume there is one more molecule to the right of this. So, the molecule which you have taken to the right of this molecule will have its NH2 group exposed to COOH. So, this COOH will condense with NH2 of adjacent molecules. So, OH from acid and H from NH2 will be condensed. So, H from NH2 meaning this will be condensed. So, basically elimination of water from here will bring a new linkage between carbonyl carbon and NH of the amino group. And that's how the product obtained would be. If I start from this NH, CH2 5 times, followed by C double bond O. And as you can see that this will keep on connecting further, meaning this C double bond O will be connected to NH, further CH2 5 C double bond O NH, so on and so forth. And 
eventually we'll be getting n number of such linkages so imagine guys if you have got one more such unit over here we are going to get c o n h that is amide linkage repeated n number of time so amide present many a time is a polyamide hence we say that this polymer which is obtained will be a polyamide fiber or a polymer and the polyamide polymer what do you call it as nylon however if you look at the starting compound a monomeric unit which we have used has how many carbons all together in the monomeric unit so one carbon from here second third fourth fifth and sixth because monomeric unit has six carbon atoms in it such polyamide meaning such nylon polymers are then referred as nylon 6 so the number that we use after the term nylon precisely indicates the number of carbon atom present in the monomeric unit so guys that is first polyamide fiber that is nylon 6 also referred as perlon l like i said in the previous class dear students it is very important that you guys understand or remember the monomeric unit and then how the polymer has been formed or how it is being represented formation of product is pretty simple since it's a condensation reaction we'll just have to identify those two functional groups like in case of nylon it is going to be carboxylic acid and the amino group which will have to expose to each other meaning we'll have to place them adjacent to each other and condense them meaning elimination small fragment like in this case it was water in some other case it could be methanol as well all right so that was all about nylon 6 the next one that we have in our list is nylon 66 as this clearly indicate nylon 66 meaning now there are going to be two monomers each monomer will be containing six carbon atom hence we call it as nylon 66 now the simple way to remember this is the moment you call it as nylon 66 from this six remember word hexa and that's how you'll begin to remember the name of monomer so six meaning hexa so the first monomer is hexa methylene diamine what is it hexa methylene diamine so suppose if i represent hexa methylene diamine i'm taking n number of amine so that is nh2 connected to six methylene so hexa methylene This is diamine. I'll write down the name. So our first monomer is hexamethylene diamine. The second six stand for a dicarboxylic acid containing six carbon atoms. So guys, when we studied carboxylic acid, I introduced you guys to the list of dicarboxylic acid and also we remember the name in a simple way. So the simple trick to remember all the names of dicarboxylic acid was Ohm's gap, O-M-S-G-A-P-S-A-S, -S, Ohm's gap, S-A-S. I'll just write it down once again. So the trick was O-M-S-G-A-P. S A S Ohm's gap S A S. Let me tell you that these are the initials of dicarboxylic acid member in this particular series. So, since it is a dicarboxylic acid, of course, the minimum number of carbon that we need to have in the molecule of that carboxylic acids are going to be two since it is dicarboxylic. So, the first member itself starts with number of carbon two. All right. So, O stand for oxalic, M stand for malonic acid, S stand for succinic acid, G stand for glutaric acid, A stand for adipic acid, P stand for pimelic acid, S stand for suberic acid, A stand for azelaic acid and the last S stand for sebacic acid. We have studied all this by the way. I'll repeat one more time. Oxalic, malonic, succinic, glutaric, adipic, pimelic, suberic, azelaic and sebacic acid of course you have to add acid term after every term that i used here so since i'm talking about nylon 66 the first six indicating a monomeric unit having six carbon which is hexamethylene diamine so the next is also the monomer having six carbon atom and it's a dicarboxylic acid so can we figure out what is that of course we can 
If oxalic acid contains two carbon, then malonic will have three, succinic four, glutaric five, and adipic will have six carbon atom. So here the monomer that we will be using in nylon 6,6 six is the adipic acid. If you go further, we are also going to learn a nylon called as nylon 6,10. So in 6,10, the 6 is going to be again hexamethylene diamine and 10 is going to be another dicarboxylic acid. So let's figure out that as well right here. 6 carbon in adipic, 7 in p-malic, 8 in suberic, 9 in azelaic and 10 in sebacic acid. So when we'll be talking about nylon 610, the 10 is going to correspond to sebacic acid. Now, how do we represent this? Everyone here? So, let's say we have hexamethylene diamine, which is going to condense to it adipic acid. Adipic acid is a dicarboxylic acid containing 6 carbon atom. Once we know that, we'll represent it this way. So, this is one of the carboxylic acid group. Since carboxylic acid is the function which is carbon containing and terminal, meaning if out of two COH, one is present to this terminal to the left hand side, the other has to be at the other terminal to the right hand side. So, two carbon will be utilized in COOH itself. We need total six carbon. So, how many CH2s will be in between? Four CH2s will be flanked between the two COOH groups. So, now I have COOH. So, guys, that is nothing but adipic acid. All right, so hexamethylene diamine and adipic acid. You can see that these are a compound containing amine as a function loop. Adipic acid, as the name suggests, has a carboxylic acid function loop. So, such compound when subjected to process of polymerization. Let's see. We are subjecting it to process of polymerization in the particular temperature range. What would happen? The acidic group, that is C-terminal of, you can say, carboxylic acid, will be condensed with N-terminal of NH2. So, condensation of carboxylic acid and amine results in the formation of amide linkage. So, we can represent like this, H from NH2. OH from acid will be condensed. So, we are eliminating water molecule such that NH will be directly connected to CO to generate amide linkage, CONH. That is your polyamide linkages you are going to get. Similarly, the OH group from the other terminal of carboxylic acid will also be condensed with H of NH2 of adjacent hexamethylene diamine, meaning like this. And that's how the formation of product upon elimination of water, <coughs> even if you don't represent elimination of water, that is absolutely fine. It is being very evident the way we have been condensing the two monomeric unit that water is being eliminated. So, if I start from here, what are we going to get? NH, CH2 six time, NH, C double bond O, CH2 four time, CO, so on and so forth. The chain will continue. So, dear students, how do we write the product? NH C double bond O CH2 since it is uh, hold on we made a mistake we'll correct it yes after NH we have got CH2 six time CH2 six times Further connected to NH, connected to now C double bond O, NH connected to C double bond O and four methylene groups. CH2 four times and again C double bond O. And as we know, since it's a polymer, this chain will keep on repeating itself n number of times. So, this product which we obtain has got many amide linkage. So, this is polyamide. Polyamide obtained from that monomers which contain 6 carbon each. Hence, you call it as nylon 6,6. Six, six. So, this product obtained is known as 
nylon 6 uh, nylon 6 6 well we are supposed to read it as 6 6 not 66 because every 6 is corresponding to the number of carbon in the monomeric unit well guys if you observe carefully you'll realize that there are there is a function of which are capable of forming hydrogen bond imagine if you have got two linear polymeric chain of nylon 6 6 run in parallel to each other then the hydrogen which is connected to electronegative nitrogen can form hydrogen bond with the adjacent polymeric chain with the oxygen of carbonyl carbon atom and that's how the two polymeric chains can be held tightly as a result of hydrogen bond and because of which such polymer can stack over each other such polymers can stack over each other and can be responsible to exist as a fiber type of polymers so if you all remember when we classified the polymers uh, we classify the polymers on the basis of intermolecular forces so we had elastomers we had fibers elastomers were the ones where polymeric chains were held together by weak van der waal forces such as uh, weak van der waal forces whereas in case of fibers the polymeric chains were held together by hydrogen bonding so this could be one of the example of that well guys so that was about nylon 66 now like we discussed about nylon 66 there exist nylon 610 as well so just briefing you about nylon 610 let's say if i'm also talking about nylon 610 we'll do small change here itself to understand nylon 610 Like I told you, simplest way to recall the monomeric unit, whenever we see the term 6, we should always think of hexa. So the first monomer is going to remain same, hexa, methylene, diamine. Now the 10 stands for a dicarboxylic acid containing 10 carbon atom. What is it? First S was suberic, A is as a like, last S is sebacic acid. So now we are going to have sebacic acid, meaning total number of carbon 10. Since it is dicarboxylic acid, at the two terminal there is going to be COH. And now total you need 10, meaning you need 8 more carbon. So if we just change this CH24 into 8, see how many carbons we will have. 1, then 8, 9, plus 1, 10. So instead of adipic acid, I would then call it as sebacic acid. So if we take 8, instead of adipic acid, we will call it as sebacic acid when you'll carry out polymerization the only difference would be instead of four it will be eight so such nylon which is then obtained because even that is going to be polyamide linkages such nylon would be referred as nylon six and ten so guys once you have studied nylon six six i don't think there is any difficulty in learning nylon six ten the only difference that we will be making while writing the structure is instead of taking the adipic acid, we'll be taking sebacic acid. All right. So we have studied three nylons so far: nylon six, nylon six six, nylon six ten. Now we'll be learning one more type of nylon, but the difference in the new nylon that we are learning, called nylon two, nylon six, is nylon two, nylon six is a biodegradable polymer biodegradable polymers are those polymer which can break down by the enzyme catalyzed reaction majorly or sometimes by the oxidative reactions as well whereas all the synthetic fibers that we have got nylon 6 nylon 6 6 or nylon 6 10 are such a synthetic fibers or polymers that cannot be broken down using enzyme catalyzed reaction hence such polymer always create pollution such polymers which create pollution which cannot be broken down we call them as non-biodegradable so so far all the example that we have come across in nylon all are non-biodegradable however nylon 2 nylon 6 is a biodegradable polymer we are going to learn a separate class of biodegradable polymer but since it's a type of a nylon we are covering that here in the nylon type itself so the next is nylon 2 nylon 6 everyone as the name is suggesting there are going to be two monomer one containing two carbon other containing six carbon so let us see what is that two carbon meaning suppose if i take alpha amino acids precisely the first member that is glycine if you all recall what we studied in bimolecule the only amino acid which is optically inactive is 
alpha amino uh, is the glycine so that's alpha amino acid all right this is a glycine this glycine i'm allowing it to condense with omega amino caproic acid so n number of nh ch2 five times COOH. Well, now let me just precisely represent this molecule for you. NH2, CH2 five times, CH2, 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 CH2 four times and one more time. And let's say COOH. All right, so this is basically a derivative of carboxylic acid having NH2 as a substituent at a particular carbon. But if you see the position of that NH2, you will realize functional loop next carbon is alpha. This is beta, gamma, delta, and omega, which means the NH2 group is present at the omega position, and so you call it as omega amino caproic acid. Overall, it has got six carbon atoms. So, six carbon monocarboxylic acid is known as caproic acid, right? So, here, other than glycine, the other monomer that we have is <coughs> omega amino caproic acid. Omega amino caproic acid is subjected to process of condensation with the glycine. So the acidic end of glycine will condense with amino group. So as we have been doing so far, water have been eliminated. Similarly, the COOH group of caproic acid will be condensed with NH2 group of glycine. So this will eliminate H. So you'll see C double bond will be connected to NH. So it's an amide linkage. So we are going to get polyamide. Polyamides are always nylon. It's just that there are two different nylons that we're using, uh, two different monomer that we're using, different monomer as in. So far, as many nylon we saw, every individual monomer just had one functional present twice. Like hexamethylene diamine or adipic acid having two carboxylic acid. So, one monomeric unit was just carrying one type of functional loop present twice. Now, here, every monomer has two different functional loop, acidic as well as NH2, even in glycine, even in omega amino caproic acid. That's the only difference. So, while writing the product, how are we going to write? NH, CH2, C double bond O, NH, CH2, five times C double bond O, so on and so forth. So, upon polymerization, What will happen now? NH, CH2, C double bond O. Now, this is further connected to NH, CH2, 5 times C double bond O. And this will be repeated n number of times. Okay. This product which is obtained is what we call it as nylon 2, nylon 6. All right. Of course, with the elimination of water molecule HOH, that is H2. So guys, these were some of the examples of nylon. Remember, the moment you come across term called as nylon, what should come in your mind is polyamide. Polyamide. So there is going to be certainly CONH linkage present in the molecule.
that was the first type of condensation containing amide linkage second type of condensation polymers are the one which contain many ester linkage so we refer them as polyester and we just study one example of polyester that is terylene terylene sometimes also referred as decron well now if you look at this term terylene this name itself talks about the monomeric unit used here this terry term stand for terephthalic acid and lean stand for ethylene glycol so the monomeric units that we are going to take are terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol so let us start with the familiar term that is ethylene glycol everyone let's say we have got a number of oh th2 CH2OH ethylene glycol. We'll write the name as well. Plus terephthalic acid. Terephthalic acid is a dicarboxylic acid present at first and the fourth position of benzene ring that is terephthalic acid you can see here it's one two three four one comma four benzene dicarboxylic acid And this will be subjected to process of polymerization. <clears throat> now we can see the two functional which will be condensing with each other are carboxylic acid and alcohol. And so far in the organic chemistry we have learned that whenever carboxylic acids are condensed with the functional of such as an alcohol they always condenses to form a product of functional which is an ester hence the process we also refer it as esterification guys that's what's going to happen here carboxylic acid loses oh alcohol loses h right hold on everyone yes similarly from the other end acid will lose oh and alcoholic group will lose h and that's how you'll see now c double bond o will be connected to o so r c double bond o o r is what we call it as an ester so the product obtained would be starting with this o ch2 ch2 o c double bond o further connected to benzene ring connected to c double bond o and that will continue the further polymeric chain n times all right so since the product contain terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol as a monomer we refer this as terylene Well, guys, similar to this terylene, there exists one more, one more type of polymer. Just as an additional polymer, I'm taking it for you guys. Instead of this benzene one four dicarboxylic acid, imagine if I take this carboxylic acid at second position. That is benzene one two dicarboxylic acid, so we call it as thalic acid. So if we take ethylene glycol and thalic acid, the polymer that we get, we call it as glyptal. Yes, instead of terephthalic acid. Which is having two COH at first and fourth position. If I take both COH adjacent to each other, ortho to each other, and carry out same condensation reaction, then the product obtained is called as glyptal. Glyptal stand for again combination of two words. G L Y stand for glycol, that is ethylene glycol, and glyptal that stand for the thalic acid. Let me represent that for you. 
let's say we are talking about glyptal. So that is for glycol and PTAL that correspond to thalic acid. So for the sake of representation, we are taking glycol once again. Alright, and condensing this with carboxylic acid. And there is another carboxylic acid present ortho to it. That is C double bond O. OH. So, thalic acid and ethylene glycol. Okay, let's write down the names as well. This we have studied earlier as well. Ethylene glycol and thalic acid. So, upon condensation, acid will lose its OH and alcohol will lose H. Similarly, from the other end, acid will lose OH and alcohol will lose H. And of this, upon further condensation, Look, what are we going to get? OCH to CH to O connected to C double bond O connected to benzene ring and adjacent position again we'll have CO and further chain. So the product would look like OCH to CH to O and now C double bond O. And this will keep on repeating itself for n number of times. So, since this is the polymer obtained by condensation of ethylene glycol and thalic acid, glycol, so GLY, and thalic acid, so PTAL, that is glyptal. So, just like terylene, the only difference lies is. Instead of having a terephthalic acid that is COH at first and fourth position, if you have it at first and second, you get glyptal. All right. So you can consider this two as an example of polyester. As you can see, functional group ester would be repeated n number of times. All right, everyone. So yes, we studied two types of condensation polymer, nylon. In nylon, what all we have included so far? We talked about uh, nylon six, called as perlon L. Then second type we saw was nylon 6,6, hexamethylene diamine and adipic acid. Similar to this, we studied nylon 6,10. 6 correspond to again hexa, methylene diamine, 10 stand for sebacic acid. And then we saw another nylon, but it is biodegradable, nylon 2, nylon 6. Nylon 2 stand for glycine, 6 stand for omega amino caproic acid. And guys, then we saw the polyester. We studied two examples of polyester. First one is sterilin, as the name suggests. Terry stand for terephthalic acid, lean stand for ethylene glycol and you got polyester. Instead of terephthalic acid, if I just take thalic acid having two COH adjacent to each other, we call it as glyptal, that is ethylene glycol and thalic acid. Okay. So, now it's time for us to learn another type of condensation polymer and the important one, you can just go through all previous year question and you will find one question have been asked from a particular part of phenol formaldehyde polymers. So, yes, we are talking about polymers of formaldehyde. Everyone, just hold on.
<coughs> okay, everyone here. So basically, this polymer talks about a formaldehyde polymer where we allow formaldehyde to react with a phenol in this case. And another example will be talking about a phenol, uh, a formaldehyde will be allowed to react with melamine. As of now, let's talk about polymer formation of formaldehyde with phenol. Okay. Let's say we have taken phenol. and allowing this to react with formaldehyde this reaction we can carry out either in acidic or in alkaline condition all right Okay, let us understand what exactly the reaction, how exactly the reaction must be taking place. To understand that, I am taking one example here. Let's say we have phenol OH. In organic chemistry, we have already studied that this OH group is activating an ortho para directing for the incoming electrophile, right? So the presence of lone pair on oxygen are in conjugation with the pi bond of the ring. Hence, when lone pair delocalizes, electron density on the ring increases, which makes it more nucleophilic. Hence, incoming electrophile will be attacked faster by the ring. And precisely speaking, attack will take place to ortho and para position. Hence, this group is known as ortho para directing. Well, now how exactly do we show that representation is, see, since I am considering condition as either acidic or alkaline, let's say we have got alkaline condition, this base will accept H plus to convert this molecule into phenoxide ion. So what we'll have now is O minus. And let's say I'm highlighting one of the H since it is ortho para directing. Now see, we have got incoming electrophile which is formaldehyde. If you observe carefully, oxygen being more electronegative, it will acquire delta minus, carbon will acquire delta plus charge. Delta plus charge present on the carbonyl carbon indicates it is electrophilic in nature. Being electrophile, it will be attacked by the nucleophile. And that's what we have studied in LDS and ketones. That LDS and ketones shows their characteristics reaction called as nucleophilic addition reaction right all right so what happens here is <coughs> negative charge since in conjugation with the pi bond pi bond will settle at ortho position and ortho position will attack at delta plus the pi bond will break towards oxygen atom if that happens see what we are getting This became double bond O pi alternate pi H. Now this C carrying two H's, so I'm writing it as CH2. Single bond O minus, right? CH2 single bond O minus it became. Now <coughs> Either we can show this O minus accepting proton from here or under alkaline condition, let's say this H will be accepted. So the sigma bond will shift back to regain its aromaticity. This bond will go back to make it O minus. So we'll be getting pi alternate pi alternate pi aromaticity got back O minus and this is also CH2 O minus. Now see, since we are treating it with acidic or alkaline condition in water, that is dilute acid or alkaline condition, this O minuses can accept H plus from solvent, either this or uh, e this as well as this. So what is this going to become? OH and this will become CH2H. The whole idea is the starting compound that we have had, phenol, has undergone reaction with formaldehyde in an acidic or in an acidic or alkaline condition 
so as to replace this H with CH2OH. Correct? Because this O minus after accepting H plus again going to become OH. So that clearly indicates that phenol is undergoing electrophilic substitution because H is lost in the form of H plus. And the incoming electrophile which has got introduced at this H was again in the form of electrophile. You can see that here. So basically phenol is reacting with formaldehyde to undergo electrophilic aromatic substitution EAS reaction to produce a product where we'll be getting hydroxy. See when this O minus will accept H plus it will become hydroxy connected to CH2. So you can call this is hydroxy methyl group present at ortho position. And why at ortho position? Because the OH group, the OH group is ortho para directing group, which means just the way hydroxy methyl has got introduced to ortho position, there's a possibility that we'll also get hydroxy methyl introduced at para position. Hence, if I talk about mono substituted product, we get ortho hydroxy methyl phenol and para hydroxy methyl phenol. And there is a possibility of poly substitution as well, meaning hydroxy methyl group can get oriented at second and fourth position as well. Which means if we summarize this whole reaction mechanism, if phenol is allowed to react with the formaldehyde in an acidic or alkaline condition, the possibility of product would be first one I'm writing the one which we saw just now with the precise mechanism that is hydroxymethyl at ortho position so this is ortho hydroxymethyl phenol plus Uh, the product would be para hydroxymethyl phenol because this group is as well as OH group is ortho para directing and if I consider poly substitution hydroxymethyl can be at second and fourth position as well OH and hydroxymethyl at both the position. Of course, theoretically, we can also consider hydroxymethyl substituting at second, fourth, as well as sixth position as well. But that's going to be too sterically crowded product. So the yield is going to be negligible. So we are not including that here. So guys, conclusion is when phenol is allowed to react with the formaldehyde in an acidic or alkaline condition we first get we first get an intermediate units which are hydroxymethylphenol either you get orthohydroxy uh, we'll get orthohydroxymethylphenol along with parahydroxymethylphenol and we may get the further poly substituted product as well now if i let's say if I separate this orthohydroxymethylphenol as an intermediate out of this tree and consider that as monomer and subject it to process of polymerization, see what do we get. So, using this one, using this one, if I carry out linear polymerization, this will result in the formation of Novolac, sometimes also called as Resol, R-E-S-O-L. So, no lack is nothing but linear polymer. And how do we represent this is? I'm taking this, okay, n number of. So that's phenol. And here we have got CH2OH. So ortho hydroxymethyl phenol, and I'm subjecting it to polymerization. So this upon polymerization. Imagine you have got many such units lined up adjacent to each other. 
so the OH group of first molecule will get condensed with H this H of second molecule so OH will be condensed with the H of adjacent unit which is this H meaning if I have got one more unit to the left hand side of this molecule then the OH of that left hand side molecule will also condense with H of this and I'll be getting a linear polymeric chain which can be represented as that's phenol now see from here H have been lost from here we have CH2 which has lost this OH and this will be connected to further polymeric chain and this will be repeated n number of times so don't we have a linear polymeric chain obtained by condensation of formaldehyde and phenol so linear polymer of phenol and formaldehyde is what we call it as Novolac or also referred as Reso like I said R-E-S-O-L so here we have got Novolac now look this is a linear polymer of phenol and formaldehyde likewise there exists a cross-linked or a network polymer of phenol and formaldehyde called as Bakelite which is what we have been have been asked earlier in the previous exams as well so how do we get the formal uh, how do we get the Bakelite is Look now what we have done, we have carried out polymerization of only orthohydroxy methylphenol. Imagine now if orthohydroxy methylphenol also condenses with 2,4 di hydroxy methylphenol. Then what happens? First, let us understand how exactly are we representing. First of all, bakelite is a cross linked. Bakelite is a cross-linked polymer. Now, this is the structure of Bakelite. How exactly are we going to get it? Let me show you. Let's say we have n number of orthohydroxymethylphenol plus n number of if we take 2,4 and subjected to polymerization Guys, pay attention to what I'm saying. See, when we had n number of only ortho hydroxymethylphenol, we got this reaction, Novolac. Correct? So, just for the sake of understanding, just imagine ortho hydroxymethylphenol upon polymerization giving you this linear polymer. So, you see, this chain is a linear polymer of that, which is condensing with another units here. If you observe the individual unit, this is 2,4, 2,4 dihydroxymethylphenol. So, this is one of the 2,4. This is another one of the two four. This is another one of the two four. So, which is here. So, when two such intermediates are condensing, in general, we can say this is one of the linear polymeric chain. This is another linear polymeric chain. And the CH2s are acting like cross linkages between the two linear polymeric chain. Hence, Bakelite is an example of cross linked or you can also call it as network polymer. And this is also an example of thermosetting. You remember? Thermosetting polymers exist as a semi-fluidish, but when you heat it, they permanently sets into infusible mass that cannot be further remelted. That is because development of this linkages in between. So, 
phenol formaldehyde has a linear polymer called as novolac and phenol formaldehyde's crosslink polymer is known as bakelite and this is how you represent how are we going to represent the structure of bakelite simplest way to represent is take two parallel linear polymeric chain this is one of the linear polymeric chain this is another linear polymeric chain but you are writing this as a mirror image you see oh is pointing upward oh is pointing downward and connect these two by ch2 linkages that's how you can remember so guys another type of condensation polymer that is polymers condensation polymer of the formaldehyde and related polymer so so far we saw two examples of formaldehyde polymers with phenol one of which is linear called novolac and the other is crosslink called bakelite now the formaldehyde also forms condensation polymer with melamine so what is melamine you will see everything on your screen right here take it easy everyone first see the structure of melamine to get the structure of melamine what you simply have to do is you have to take a benzene type of molecule just to represent here you see you have got benzene type of molecule it's just that every alternate carbon is represented by nitrogen so let's say carbon nitrogen carbon nitrogen carbon nitrogen right so alternate you put nitrogen now wherever you see carbon attach nh2 there so nh2 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 that's how we got the structure of melamine now let's say we have got the same melamine i'm writing it here let's say i've highlighted one of the nh2 groups. so this nh2 group you see that here which is allowed to react with formaldehyde now just like a few minutes back we studied the reaction mechanism between phenol and formaldehyde we can operate the same mechanism here how come across carbonyl carbon oxygen being more electronegative we require delta minus carbon will acquire delta plus now electron rich nitrogen will attack at the deficient carbon this bond will break right so what will we be getting is nh carrying one more h lone pair have now formed a bond with c so since lone pair have been shared it will carry positive charge carbon is carrying two h's single bond o minus so i can write it as ch to o minus now see this will further undergo intramolecular proton transfer meaning let's say this unit will undergo deprotonation so that this bond can go back and regain its lone pair h plus which is lost is accepted by this o minus so this is going to give us nh with lone pair further connected to ch2 o accepting h there is ch2 see we again got hydroxy methyl introduced at n over there hydroxy methyl was getting introduced at the ortho and para position so basically nh2 upon reaction with formaldehyde will give you nhch2h you see that nhch2h now this is our intermediate just like we had ortho hydroxy methyl as an intermediate which was used for polymerization in novolac now this is our intermediate also known as resin intermediate so if you take n number of this and subject it to polymerization imagine you have got many such adjacent to each other so what is going to happen is the oh part of this okay hold on everyone this is ch2 by the way if not visible so this oh will be condensed with h of this nh2 so out of two h's let's say one will be lost similarly one more h will also be lost from here as well so see what are we going to get nhch2 dash which will be further continued nhch2 nhch2 dash which will be continued this nh2 has lost one more h so one h is still intact and even this has lost one of this so even this will continue so that's how melamine upon condensation reaction with formaldehyde uh, melamine upon reaction with formaldehyde will first form an intermediate which upon condensation polymerization will give you melamine polymer since it is obtained by condensation of melamine and formaldehyde we call it as melamine formaldehyde polymer melamine formaldehyde polymer yes everyone 
so yes that was all about the condensation polymer obtained from formaldehyde and other compounds such as phenol and melamine so we have covered three important types under the condensation first one was nylon under nylon what all we studied nylon 6 nylon 66 six, nylon 16 nylon 2 nylon 6 four polymer then we talked about polyester we studied two example terylene and glyptal and now under formaldehyde and related polymer we studied two first is phenol and formaldehyde under which we studied two more that is novolac and bakelite and now formaldehyde and melamine and now finally guys we'll be discussing about the biodegradable polymer well before you enter into biodegradable let us understand one more term similar to this called biopolymer now what are biopolymers well in our life processes there are some polymeric species which are very important for the growth and the maintenance of a living organism for example daily we eat food one of which more important or common food is carbohydrates like we eat rice like we eat sugar so those are carbohydrates if i talk about carbohydrates such as cellulose or starch what are they starch is made up of many glucose units linked to each other what are cellulose cellulose is also polymer of glucose molecule which means cellulose and starch are the polymeric chain of glucose but those are essential for the life processes and those can be easily decomposed by the simple enzyme catalyzed reaction or rarely by oxidation as well so such polymers which can be broken down using enzyme catalyzed reaction you call them as degradable polymer so all the biopolymers the naturally occurring polymers are biodegradable like i said one of example is uh, cellulose similar to that even protein let's talk about protein in fact when we eat protein they undergo hydrolysis process to produce various amino acids which are the building blocks of muscles isn't it so protein is another biopolymer or even if you talk about dna rna those are polynucleotides so all these examples polysaccharides uh, protein molecules or the dna and rna that is polynucleotide all these examples belong to category of a biopolymer these biopolymers can be easily broken down using enzyme catalyzed reaction so we call them as biodegradable however most of the synthetic polymers such as nylons other than nylon 2 nylon 6 if i talk about nylon 6 or nylon 6 6 those polymers cannot be broken down by the enzyme catalyzed reactions and hence they create pollution so we call them as non biodegradable of course making excessive use of such kind of polymers in our daily life is going to increase a problem of pollution hence we had to find out alternative way which are synthetic but yet biodegradable so we talk about some polymer which are synthetic but yet biodegradable one of which we have already studied nylon 2 nylon 6 and other than that as far as our syllabus is concerned we studied two more one is phbv phbv is an abbreviation for poly beta hydroxybutyrate coordinated to beta hydroxyvalerate and we'll also talk about pla and pga so everyone first have a look at this poly beta hydroxybutyrate and beta hydroxyvalerate okay guys look here First, let's talk about beta hydroxybutyric acid. Okay, so let's say I'm taking n number of hydroxy present at beta carbon. Let's say this is beta. So this is going to be alpha and functional of COOH. Now, butyrate indicates it's a conjugate base of butyric acid. Butyric acid is an acid containing four carbon atoms. So far, we have one, two, three. So, there will be one more. Using Greek letters, if I number the carbon, a carbon which is next to function group is alpha. Adjacent to which is beta. So, this is beta hydroxybutyric acid. We'll just write down the name. beta hydroxy 
butyric acid and now i'm going to condense this with beta hydroxy valeric acid valeric acid is a monocarboxylic acid containing five carbon butyric has four valeric will have five but hydroxy is still at beta meaning other than ch3 we'll have one more carbon so increasing the length of carbon chain by one we'll be getting beta hydroxy valeric so let's say now we have n number of oh and i made it c2h5 so i've increased one carbon here in the chain that's alpha carbon and cooh now see carbon next to function group is alpha this is beta so beta carrying hydroxy group total number of carbon 1 2 3 4 and 5 5 is valeric acid so we call it as beta hydroxy valeric acid okay and we are subjecting it to process of polymerization So now you can see the alcoholic OH group is adjacent to the carboxylic group. So whenever alcoholic OH condenses with carboxylic acid, it gives you an ester. So OH and H acid will give OH, alcohol will give H. Upon condensation, we are eliminating small fragments such as water molecule. Same thing will happen from the the carbon terminal of beta hydroxy valeric so the cooh of valeric will condense its oh with the h of alcoholic oh of butyric acid so what are we going to get o ch ch3 ch2 c double bond o o so coo is the ester function right r c double bond o o r dash that is an ester so we are going to get polyester if you write it together it will look like this starting with this o CH3 CH2 C double bond so this is the part from beta hydroxy butyric acid and now we have got other part from valeric acid so COO so that is that is an ester <laughs> CH C2H5 CH2 C double bond O and this will keep on repeating n number of time indicating ester linkage will be repeated n number of times so this is a polyester now since this is obtained by condensation of beta hydroxy valeric acid with beta hydroxy uh, beta hydroxy butyric acid with beta hydroxy valeric we call it as poly beta hydroxy butyrate co beta hydroxy valerate simply collectively called as phbv now this is the ester linkage which can be easily broken down by the enzyme catalyzed reaction and hence they can be easily subjected to the process of degradation hence create no pollution so we call them as biodegradable polymer so first example we saw way back in nylon that is nylon 2 nylon 6 this is the second phpv and now the third one that we are discussing is polyglycolic acid and polylactic acid well <coughs> Now, polyglycolic acid indicates you need a glycolic acid first. Well, guys, so far the example that we studied was ethylene glycol. Recall that. This is what you call it as ethylene glycol, right? Both are alcoholic function group. Now, suppose if I oxidize one of the primary alcohol group, primary alcohol upon strong oxidation get converted to what? COOH. So, if I oxidize one of the alcoholic group to acid, since it's an acid obtained from glycol, we call it as glycolic acid. So what is going to be glycolic acid? OH, CH2, COOH. A primary alcohol is oxidized to acid without any change in the number of carbon. So we represent like this. We have got N number of glycolic acid. 
So that is glycolic acid. This glycolic acid will be now condensed with lactic acid. Now, what is lactic acid? In the same glycolic acid, add this alpha carbon. Add this alpha carbon. If I replace 1 H with methyl, it becomes lactic acid. See, by replacing 1 H with methyl, this carbon will become chiral carbon atom. And that's why whenever we study optical activity in, in a stereoisomerism, the first example that we always consider for learning the chiral carbon atom is the lactic acid. So simply, if you substitute one of the H by methyl, we are going to get lactic acid. So now it becomes easier for me to remember the lactic acid. Right everyone, you see that's a chiral carbon atom. So sometime you may have a question related to this as well. Which of the following polymer is chiral? So one of such example is this polyglycolic and polylactic acid. Well, if you look at this compound as well, this beta hydroxybutyric and beta hydroxyvaleric acid also have this carbon, which is a chiral carbon atom. So even these two monomers will produce a polymer, which is going to be chiral. So this two example, PHBV and polyglycolic and polylactic that is PGA and PLA are the example which contains optical activity in their product as well as in their reactant that is monomeric unit so remember that as a data well let's write down the name that is lactic acid and this will be subjected to process of polymerization <clears throat> so upon polymerization the acidic end of glycolic acid will be condensed with the alcoholic OH so acid will lose OH alcohol will lose H similarly lactic acid also have the acidic end so it will lose OH and that will be condensed with alcoholic H of glycolic acid. Now this upon condensation, <clears throat> what we are going to get, starting with this O. CH2 connected to C double bond O. Further connected to O, CH, CH3. O C H C H three and connected to C double bond O. And this will be repeated n number of times. So everyone, even PGA PLA, that is polyglycolic polylactic acid, sometimes also referred as PLGA, polylactic glycolic acid. PLGA, this can be called as commonly. You'll see the function group is an ester. So this is also a polyester. Commonly I can refer this as P. L G A. So this is one of the example of biodegradable polymer. Well, everyone, what we have done so far, let me just quickly summarize it for you. Today we started our discussion of polymer with the second type of polymer that is condensation polymer or step growth polymerization product. So we started with the first type called as nylon. Nylons meaning the moment we talk about nylon, you should recall that yes, it is polyamide. In polyamide, we studied four types of polyamide fiber, nylon 6, where the monomeric unit was epsilon caprolectum. Second, we studied nylon 6, 6. So the moment you hear 6, you should think of hexa. So the monomers were hexa, methylene, diamine and adipic acid. After that, we studied nylon 6, 10. So in 6, 10, the 6 is again hexa, methylene, diamine, 10 for sebacic acid. Nylon 2, nylon 6 uses monomer called glycine and omega amino caproic acid. Then we studied polyester, as the name suggests, ester, meaning the function is going to be an ester over there. So the first example we studied was terylene, also known as decron. Terylene, if you look at the name, teri stands for terephthalic acid, terylene, lin stands for ethylene glycol. Similar to terylene, we also studied glyptal. 
So the only difference that the name is different, but the monomers are more or less same. So glyptal GLY stands for ethylene glycol, which we used earlier, and PTAL stands for thalic acid. So instead of terephthalic, if you just use thalic, that is two COH at first and second position, it is thalic acid. You get glyptal. After that polyester, we studied the formaldehyde related polymer. First, we took formaldehyde and phenol. We got two polymer, novolac, which is linear, and bakelite, which is cross-linked. Then we saw melamine and formaldehyde. As the name suggests, there is melamine and formaldehyde as monomer. And then under biodegradable, nylon 2, nylon 6 was studied earlier. We studied PHBV and now we studied polyglycolic polylactic acid. And now guys, the last subtopic for this chapter which we have to learn is the molar mass or molecular mass of polymer. Well, often we see whenever we talk about polymer, we use a term called as average molecular mass of polymer whereas when we talk about any other simple compounds we just talk about molecular mass of compound like if i have to talk about <coughs> let's say a molecular mass of acetic acid i'll simply say it's a molecular mass of acetic acid or any other example you take like we say in case of methane 16 is a molecular mass of methane we never say average molecular mass of methane but when it comes to polymer, we always refer term called as average molecular mass of polymer. So first, let us understand why do we call it as average molecular mass? Well, to understand this, guys, let's take a simple example. Imagine that we have got a vessel containing a sample of polymer. This is a vessel. And this vessel is containing a solution of polymer. Now, we all are aware that uh, polymer is made up of monomeric units. So, let's say these are the monomeric unit. Okay, now see. When I say that a vessel is containing a sample of a polymer, that sample solution of polymer not necessarily will always have just one polymeric chain. In fact, it is very rare to have just one polymeric chain. A sample solution of whichever particular polymer you talk about contains many polymeric chain inside it. So let us say I'm first talking about first polymeric chain. So let's say one of the polymeric chain is made up of combination of this monomeric unit. So First monomer connected to second, second connected to third, third connected to fourth, fourth connected to fifth. So let's say this is one of the polymeric chain. This one of the polymeric chain, I am referring it as N1. Okay, one of the polymeric chain. Now this polymeric chain is obtained by the combination of four, uh, five monomeric units. One, two, three, four and five. Likewise, let's say there is another polymeric chain present. That another polymeric chain is formed by condensation of, <coughs> let's say, three monomeric unit. So that polymeric chain, I am referring it as N2. And likewise, there is third polymeric chain, which I am representing here. See, this polymeric chain, I am calling it as third polymeric chain N3. But this polymeric chain again have got, okay, let me take one more monomer just to differentiate them, nothing else. Now, this polymeric chain has got how many monomer? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So, you will see here, in a sample solution of polymer, there are various polymeric chain, but not all polymeric chain are always going to be of identical molar mass. Why? Because those polymeric chain contain different number of monomeric unit. As the number of monomeric unit will change, their molecular mass is also going to change. So, this example is including only three polymeric chain. Imagine if you have got many polymeric chain present together in the sample solution of polymer, all the polymeric chain will be of different molecular mass. When there are so many polymeric chain present of various molecular mass, we cannot have a precise molecular mass of 
whole polymer. So in that case, we express the molecular mass of polymer as an average molecular mass. That's why guys, you will find the molecular mass we always express in terms of average molecular mass. So like for, <coughs> like for the first chain N1, it will have some molecular mass. Let's call it as uh, its molecular weight. I'm calling it as M1. For second chain, I'm calling it as molecular mass as M2. For third, I'm calling it as molecular mass of M3. Right? So using the polymeric chain and their corresponding molecular mass, we express the molecular mass in several ways. I repeat, using the number of polymeric chain, as many they are present, and their corresponding molecular mass, we express the average molecular mass of polymer in several ways. Now, those several ways depending upon the several ways depending upon which process have been used to calculate that molecular mass. Just like there are several methods, like uh, <clears throat> you can say osmometry is one of the processes which is used to find out a molecular mass, which we call it as number average molecular mass. Then there is light scattering experiment, which is used to calculate the molecular mass of protein, which emphasizes on the molecular weight of a larger molecule. So we call it as average weight, average molecular mass. So there are several ways by which we calculate molecular mass and those various ways of calculating molecular mass can be simply called as, as you can see on your screen here, <coughs> the molecular mass of polymer is expressed as either number average molecular mass, which we should uh, read it as M bar N, M or M N bar you can call it. Number average molecular mass indicates that it is talking about number of polymeric chain. So we write it as M bar N or MN bar. Second way of expressing now number average molecular mass is what we express using the osmometry experiment. Whereas experimentally weight average molecular mass, which we write it as M bar W is found out by the light scattering experiment, which we don't really have to include in our syllabus. We don't study the experimental methods of calculating the ways. What we are interested in, if a molecular mass is given, we need to understand why do we use term average molecular mass? And if any question comes in the exam, how are we going to solve those questions? Okay. So average molecular mass of polymer can be expressed in two ways. Number average molecular mass, that is M bar N and weight average molecular mass, that is M bar W. Now, this two can be simply represented by this formula. Look. Number average molecular mass is the ratio of is the ratio of total mass of all the polymeric chains by the total number of polymeric chains. So Ni Mi indicate it is sum of as many like we have got N1, N2, N3. So if N1 is multiplied by M1, we'll be getting N1, M1. If N2, if you multiply to M2, we'll be getting N2, M2. If N3, if I multiply to, if we multiply to M3, we'll be getting N3, M3. Now, as many such polymeric chains are there, if I take summation of all the polymeric chains, so what is it going to be? Sum of Ni, Mi upon total number of polymeric chains, so sum of Ni. This is what gives you the number average molecular mass. Similar to that, now if I take the square of molecular weight, because the significance of weight average molecular mass is its talk about or it rather consider those polymeric chain which has got larger or higher molecular mass. So molecular mass of polymeric chain is more important here. So weight average molecular mass M bar W is expressed as ratio of sum of Ni into Mi square upon Ni into Mi. So basically, whatever was the numerator has become denominator over here. Okay. Well, what is NIMI stand for? We have already mentioned. N stand for the number of polymeric chain. M stand for their corresponding weight. So where NI is the number of polymeric chain, meaning molecules of polymer having molecular mass, MI. So guys, this is the basic information of number average and weight average molecular mass. Now, why do we do that? Well, using this 
weight average molecular mass and number average molecular mass we find out something called as polydispersity index that is called pdi by the way most of the cases or ra rather for all the uh, occurring polymer naturally occurring polymer you will find that uh, the weight average molecular mass generally is found to be more than the number average molecular mass hence if you consider natural polymer and synthetic polymers you will find in case of synthetic polymer weight average molecular mass is higher but in case of natural polymers it is almost the same the weight average and the number average molecular mass so when you take an average of this two the ratio of weight to the number weight to the number average molecular mass that is m bar w to the m bar n is what you call it as polydispersity index that is pdi so like i said the naturally occurring polymers are monodispersed monodispersed meaning what when the ratio of this two will become one when will the ratio of this two will become one when m bar w and m bar n is same so in case of natural polymer you will find that natural polymers which are generally found to be monodispersed monodispersed meaning the pdi is unity that is m bar w and m bar n are same but in case of synthetic polymer you will always find that m bar w is more than m bar n so in synthetic polymers which are always polydispersed polydispersed meaning ratio has to be more than one for this ratio to be more than one m bar w has to be more so in that case m bar w is always higher than m bar n so everyone we first understood why do we use term called average molecular mass second we studied the average molecular mass can be expressed as far as our syllabus is concerned using two methods weight average molecular mass number average molecular mass ratio of these two is called polydispersity index for naturally occurring polymers it is generally going to be one so you call it as monodispersed polymer and for synthetic polymers it is always going to be more than unity more than one so you call it as polydispersed or heterogeneous polymer now what kind of question that they can ask i'm just taking one simple example the question says <clears throat> calculate the average molecular mass well we'll consider average molecular mass in terms of weight as well as in terms of number so we are going to calculate m bar n as well as m bar w so calculate the average molecular mass of polymer sample let's say in that solution sample vessel we had taken sample solution in which there are 30% molecules have molecular mass of 20000 well guys what are they telling us 30% meaning let's say they have tell, told us that n1 is 30 having its molar mass 20000 so let's say this is m1 40% so this is n2 number of polymeric units having molecular mass of 30 and rest 30 rest 30 is your n3 have molecular molecular mass of 60000 so this is molecular mass m3 by the way first calculate the total is 100 so n1 30 n2 40 70 plus n3 30 100% so all the monomeric all the sorry polymeric chain have been included here and now they are saying with this data find out the average molecular mass well guys <clears throat> suppose if i talk about number average molecular mass m bar n is given by what sum of ni mi upon total number of polymeric units so here if i apply that how it will be nimi so first is n1 into m1 what is n1 30 into m1 20000 the 30 into 20000 sum see it's a summation meaning plus n2 into m2 that is 40 into 30000 plus n3 m3 30 into m3 60000 30 into 
60,000 whole divided by sum of ni sum of ni is what n1 plus n2 plus n3 30 plus 40 plus 30 right everyone so if you calculate all this you will end up getting your answer as 36 thousand so number average molecular mass of a uh, sample solution of polymer having this data is 36,000 if you calculate now likewise suppose if you calculate weight average molecular mass m bar w it will be what summation of ni and square of molar mass mi square divided by sum of ni into mi meaning total mass of all the polymeric units so this will be given by see now the only difference that we'll have to do is this 20,000 that we have taken we'll have to take square of that so this is basically 30 into square of 20,000 this plus 40 into square of 30 <clears throat> 40 into square of 30,000 plus 30 into square of 60,000 and the full divided by nimi meaning the number of monomeric unit number of polymeric unit into sum of number of polymeric unit into its corresponding molecular mass that's the total mass that we are doing so whatever numerator is here we'll be taking here as the denominator so 30 into 20000 plus 14 to 30000 30,000 okay here also 20,000 and plus 13 to 60,000 all right and this if you calculate well approximately this will be around 43,333. Well, guys, this number you can calculate and find out the exact figure. This is approximately, I think, would be the answer. Well, so basically what is important if the data is given, we should be knowing the formula and we'll, we should be able to put it that way. If we take a ratio of M bar W and M bar N, that's going to be polydispersity index. We can clearly see that M bar W is more than M bar N, which means this is going to be a polydisperse. So probably this is the synthetic polymer that we have got. So guys, that was the last thing that was left from the chapter polymer. So other than important polymers, you guys should know the molecular mass of polymer and how and why do we call it as average molecular mass? What are the different ways by which we can express it? All right, guys. So, dear student, that is it from our today's class of polymer. And with this, we have finished polymer as well. In the previous class, we discussed about classification of polymer and some important addition polymer. Today, we took another category that is the condensation polymer, which include nylon, then polyester, then formaldehyde related polymer, biodegradable and non-biodegradable. And we also covered the molecular mass. So, guys, that is it from our class. Thank you so much for attending the session. I wish you all, all the best and I'll see you for one more chapter that is chemistry in everyday life. It is totally an informative chapter. Uh, I want you guys to just attend that class and try to remember the data as long as you can because you'll be coming across many, many types of drugs and many examples of drugs basically. So the task is going to be for you guys to remember all the names. Well, we'll see that very soon. Thank you so much.